Hello. My name is Alberto Petronio. Uh, I'm a vehicle concept artist in uh, Cloud Imperium Games, Manchester. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I work on a video game called Star Citizen. It's an online multiplayer uh, space simulator, particularly based on the design of spaceships. And today I'm going to talk to you about how much I love to talk about myself, but also about spaceships. Do you like spaceships? That's good, because I don't know how to do anything else. Um, just to sum, make a little sum about uh, where I come from, for my career, I started my career in Italy. Uh, I'm Italian. I studied product design in uh, Turin, in AAAD. I graduated in collaboration with a company called Pininfarina uh, in a, with a thesis about space living and how to make that kind of environment, basically living in a thing can a little more pleasant. And right after the thesis, I started working as product, product designer. Uh, I've been there for around four tragic years. Moved to Germany for one year, the last happy year of my life. And then I did this choice of moving to England, which is a great place if you like political stability. Uh, going back in 2015, um, I entered the design world in a quite harsh way. For those who doesn't know, Pininfarina is a car company, uh, particularly famous because they were the designers of Ferrari till 2012, and I was in the extra section. We were basically doing everything that was not a car, including yachts, planes, trains, buses, bikes, and really a lot of different kind of objects. I selected some for you to express a bit um, what's my path. I had a presentation ready when I got accepted to the Blender conference and then someone told me, no, you cannot do that because we have the rights. So I have to improvise it a bit. And I use my portfolio a lot um, to show you what is actually, uh, what actually led me to my uh, final pipeline and how that can change in the future. And I think this might be an opportunity to give you my opinion about why personal work is fundamental for growing as an artist. So one of my first projects was uh, quite a big project. Uh, I think Cantieri and Rossinavi were big partners of Pininfarina. We started doing this yacht literally in the first day I arrived during my internship of six months. 100 million euros yacht for a Swiss banker, 70 meters, three swimming pools. The main bedroom is bigger than my parents' house and way bigger than mine. <laughs> And about this, I didn't do the final renders. I merely did the design for the exteriors. And it was my first approach to the nautic uh, world, to vehicles world, actually. And I might have started understanding that I was liking what I was doing. Other kind of vehicles I've done was more simple. This was, this was actually for an electric bike for a Dutch company called Evolutione, uh, which was presented in 2017 uh, in, um, in Germany. I don't remember exactly what was the event, but took quite a lot of prizes. I'm very proud of that. So the major of my city presenting it, it was a fun way of learning how to do new things in a much different way by a yacht, because you have to be more subtle, more city-like, and it was nice to see it complete. And something a little different, which I would have never thought I would have ever designed, was actually this project for Ventus. This is a snow cannon. So um, in product design and vehicle design, we really love the environments, and that's why we shoot snow to let rich people have fun. <laughs> and there was a point in um, my career as product designer that I was questioning a lot about the kind of products I was doing, especially after we had six months working with Shell, I started having a lot of doubts about myself and the ethical meaning of what I was doing. So I started studying concept art because I wanted to move in the industry of gaming or movies and leave this very marketing-driven um, market behind me. But before I move on, I'd like to show you one last portfolio piece that is really, uh, I, I'm, it makes me really proud. 
Um, Pink Farina is owned by the 20% by was owned by the 20% by Elenia Aerospace, a French company that worked for ACE at the European Space Agency. We, like this, had the possibility to talk with Paolo Nespoli, Italian astronaut, he's a veteran, three missions into space, uh, the oldest man ever been on the ISS, and we got in contact with him and asked him if we could do a low budget, which means one person, uh, project, and give him actually a pen to bring in on the ISS. We gave it to him and to his crew. Uh, one got lost, it's still there, and the other ones are in Houston. So this is quite um, a good memory, actually. Uh, then we move on. I went to Germany. I work with a lot of you. I miss you. I love you, etc. Um, my first project was actually working on the spaceships for uh, DLC for X4, Split Vendetta, learning something completely different, learning Blender for the first time almost four years ago. So I'm not a veteran, unlike many of you. And I think I might tell a different kind of story because I really passed through Max, through Maya, through Cinema 4D and Rhinoceros and I must admit that Blender, despite having an amazing feature, what really has that I like is that allow me to be in a stream of consciousness while I create without too many or almost at all recently issues with UI obstacles that distance you from art. And these are some of the spaceship we did in that year and we did interiors. I really liked the creative freedom that there was in an indie studio as uh, right after that I moved in a AAA game. Uh, there is no possibility in a AAA company to put your dog in the Christmas card. I love my dog. And then in 2020, uh, COVID started, I moved to England in Manchester, um, working for what actually was my dream. Uh, Star Citizen. I was following the project since a lot of times. I thought that was the kind of design I, work, I want to work on and I went to compromise. They did not hire me as a concept artist, they'd hire me as a 3D vehicle artist and I thought it was well enough because when you grow up in a country that have the 30% unemployment, you start thinking about the job as something that might not be a right but a privilege. So you take what you get and you shut up about it. After Two years there, I quite thought I did an error, that I should have been more proud of myself and tried more. So after the second, the first year was past doing this project, it was the Starlifter C2, A2. And the second year was much more technical, much more bug fixing, these areas, LODs. I wasn't really happy. So after a bit of insisting, I threatened to leave unless I could have gone in a creative position and come back to where I started from. So I become concept artist. And then there was the energy crisis and then I threatened to leave again and I became a senior concept artist. So if you want to take this from this talk is that ultimatums work. I see a divorce in my future. <laughs> And in case any of you might be interested, um, on behalf of the company, I can tell you we are hiring uh, in any field, really, but if you have any questions about or the 3D vehicle art or the concept vehicle art, uh, feel free to ask any question. I can make a recommendation or give me the right email. I would like to focus the, on uh, what's the meaning of, a, of the personal portfolio, the spied work. I started doing personal portfolio with Cinema 4D and Kishut. So despite Cinema 4D not being as bad as I find 3D Max to be, there was still a lot uh, that was lacking and that I couldn't understand because I didn't try yet before 2019 with Lino that taught me everything he knew. Thank you very much. Um, how much I was missing not having the possibility of working, for example, with an integrated render engine inside a software or all the, the possibility to not keep switching between uh, software, which is, despite being very cozy and comfortable, is also very economical. Because I remember spending around 6,000 6, euros for Cinema 4D and now I can say it didn't worth it. So I did the switch. Um, we worked close to each other for like a month, every day, at least four hours a day, just to teach me Blender. 
And after that, I never came back on uh, Cinema 4D, despite I had the license. license. And I started doing more um, portfolio and personal pieces with Blender. Why I'm focusing so much on this? I think, and I really couldn't insist, couldn't insist more on this point, that you should risk everything you can in a safe space, in a safe space, your bedroom, your um, your home, and consolidate after during your work. Every time, for motivating myself, doing more. Um, personal projects, I try to do something I've never did before. I never used Blender in this case. I never made a spaceship in this one. It was 2019. This, place, this project was a disaster. It was 12 gigabytes uh, of file, the, so many stupid textures that were not needed. EV crashed all the time. I had to do the, all the renders in cycles. So the next one was actually learning how to do something properly optimized, how to learn how to make a spaceship in the way Star Citizen did it, because I wanted to go there. So I studied how they work. I tried to make a portfolio specifically for them. And using their techniques, like trim sheets, that doesn't require baking, it's not high poly, it's not low poly, it's mid poly with weighted normals. And with this kind of textures based on our horizontal sheet, you can exceed the one, um, the 0 0.1 space and go over and make virtually infinite the possibility of resolution that you have and using one set of texture for 700 spaceships. As Star Citizen have many of them and the computer of our players have limited space. So we, not, we cannot add texture like, like for a movie production. Is a little example of how they works. They can be reusable. You scale it down, you scale it up, depending by how close you go with um, with the camera for a player. I tend to use box mapping uh, for the rough map, and I try to keep it on an object so it doesn't repeat when you repeat the asset. It just or you just repeat the normal and maybe the opacity that comes through the previous texture. And of course. A couple of modifiers to make your life easy, let it look like it is high poly, but it's not. This is um, the weighted uh, normal modifier. In Star Citizen, the production team uses uh, scripted tools for 3D Max, which are much more complicated. This modifier in Blender simply get the largest faces and keep them flat and let bend the normals on the smallest faces. What happens is that let's take the glass in this case, it is just uh, one segment, but it looks high poly and makes your life much easier, not just in production, but also in pre-production. If my art director comes and tells me we have to redo the glass, I would like to avoid suicide that week. So maybe with less polygon, we can help each other. Plus I can also give the file to the 3D artist and they don't have to work too much or rework too much. In case you want, um, I have, since a couple of years, this file for free. Uh, please don't sell it on CG Trader. it happened. It is for studying only, but it's a good example of what the pipeline in a new generation hard surface production uh, company. So as I was saying before, let's try to learn different things. Let's try to improve the knowledge of um, the tools I have, it was lockdown, it was 2020, first lockdown in COVID, I was new in England, new nobody. Let's try Grease Pencil. I had a beautiful tutorial from Yama Yurabaev, actually presented a couple of years, in 2018, I believe, here, and watched that tutorial a lot, and I thought, well, this, can be, this can be fun. Grease Pencil has a lot of um, strokes, a lot of points, it creates a lot of noises if used in this way, so I thought it might have been perfect for simulating details, whether I don't even think about it. There is this video on YouTube, I will not show it all because it's six minutes, and sorry, the camera is very wobbly, but gives an idea of how versatile a tool can be and how I try to use different tools that are not done for what I'm doing 
to expand, and maybe I will not use it anymore, but I will still expand the knowledge I have in Blender. And that time that might be, uh, I will be on my laptop at working from home and I don't have a science of Photoshop, but I still want to make a couple of sketches, but I don't have a pen, I can do that here. So I did all the strokes in 2D and then used the edit mode to just reset them and move them in space, having something completely, uh, I mean, you cannot do that in uh, other ways in Blender. Maybe you can do that in Gravity Sketch, but it's a good way of exploring different things. I hope. It's very confusing, I'm aware. Thanks. Going over this. After I did that, I actually haven't done much for a year because I was absolutely burned out by, by England, by the, the job, by the lockdown, so it took me a while. But when I do a personal project to motivate myself, I try to hit two birds with one stone. So I try to improve my portfolio because that gives you job opportunities, give you uh, network opportunities, but I also try to learn new things. So I wanted to learn animation and rigging, basic rigging, because doing a lot of mechas is useful. Sometimes to show your art director, your concept, your uh, designers, how that specific things might work in a video game as we have a lot of interactions in this kind of stuff. It's good to be aware of all the tools that can help you. Plus, AMD was doing a um, challenge at the time. So I hit three birds with a stone. I have a nice portfolio project. I've learned rigging. And I have a 5,000 CPU, 5,000 euro CPU. So I guess I won with this artwork and then got back on it. Inspired to Horizon Zero Dawn, obviously. And it was a good opportunity to learn how to do different things, different kind of shaders, something less metallic -y, something more militaristic. And then, of course, how to make a walk cycle. Uh, I don't care too much about production issues like on penetrations. This is just the possibility of myself, uh, for myself to have a tool that let me explain my superior or Chris Roberts or my art director what uh, something can look like one citizen game. Then everything gets scrapped and the 3D artist, the expert one, the one that knows technical stuff that can bear with LODs, uh, animations, rigging, then they will take care of it. This is just to give them uh, an indication. If you look at the skeleton, uh, it's <laughs> It works, but I wouldn't put it in a movie. And sometimes I try to expand and go in different things. Uh, 24th of February, we were, uh, all of Europe was kind of shocked by what happened in Ukraine. So I contacted, uh, I got contacted by a association in uh, Lviv, Leopoli. Um, they were asking for artworks to turn into NFTs for financing the right cross in uh, Lviv and Kiev. So mixing different techniques, 2D and 3D, I came out with this. Uh, that was done in alpha day for the 3D and the other half for the overpaint. It was my only NFTs ever done, but uh, it was a bit outside of my comfort zone, but still was useful to have this approach because I would have used it after a lot in uh, the concept team in uh, Onstar Citizen. Uh, little note, uh, I saw this on um, Reddit, a lot of people saying, oh, that's not a Russian tongue, come on, man. Someone else uh, commenting, well, that's a Nazi tank, maybe he's comparing Russians to Nazis, and I really appreciate that you think I'm that smart, but I just don't know anything about tanks, and I'd like to keep it like this. Some experiments with 2D, as I'm using it a lot recently. Uh, I use Photoshop, sometimes Chris Pencil, have you seen, or Procreate, but recently I think paper is still the best way, and then I moved directly in 3D, so I can check everything. Um, 
um, every dimension, every size, every interaction. So that astronaut went really well on our station. I thought, let's try to do something I've never done again. Let's do props. Uh, I thought this was quite successful. I really liked this project. I did the gun as well. Also to improve a smaller scale of the things that I generally did for all my life. I cannot put animations in the same time. I apologize about that. So I tried, did some experiment with Eevee. I think that Eevee compared to cycles work very well and very fast on small things, but increasing the scale, it becomes a little problematic with compenetrations, ZDAPT, uh, AO not working properly. So I just try to mix both of them, and I think is one of the main point of using Blender, the fact that you can use the same nodes both on Eevee and cycles, and that's probably the main reason I never downloaded Octane. And now we arrive here. This is my last project. I presented it in uh, GFD North in Manchester. There is a full conference based on it. You can find it on Vimeo. Uh, this is the kind of scale I generally work with, the kind of scale I like to work with. And this was another project done for learning something. I needed to make better uh, and more optimize my uh, production for concept to give to other artists. So. I think that I would suggest to people that want to go in this world and want to create models from scratch is please use references. A lot of them and well chosen. I generally use PureRef. I have a big folder with a lot of them, like I'm talking about thousands. And then each project has its own with some from the real world and some from uh, other artists. We have Paul Pepera on the bottom, Star Citizen, uh, Chris Foss, and Paul Chadesson. I try to not put too many, to not confuse myself. Uh, try to stick and stay true to the project. And I'll just show you some, some of the shots that came out of it. So some is just 3D and studio light, some is HDRI and overpaint, uh, some shot to give a better sense of scale, uh, some to have a more spectacular, um, Spectacular view, some, some, some more suggestive. Sorry for my accent, I'm very nervous. And every time I'm nervous, I become more Italian than usual. <laughs> there is some shot, there are interiors. This was literally trying to create the pipeline first to get a better pipeline for the citizen on my own time. And this kind of project pays back because once it is on our station, people will connect it to you, will ask you how you do that, you will meet people, and despite just having a, one more piece and have learned something, it's really useful, especially in this community, to get to know more people. And after that, I actually got a lot of kitbash that I would have used in the future. These are some of the engines that you've seen in the, in the previous shots. And this was the main pusher. There's a bit of Gribble, get some part from uh, Ian Hubert. I ask his permission, not like people that resell my stuff on uh, CG Trader. <laughs> Try to experiment with some animations, some with, done with EVs, some done with cycles. And as you can see by the flicker, this was done with cycle. Again, this is not perfect, but if I have to explain my art director in uh, Alpha Day uh, how these things work, this is enough. It's quite simple shading, quite simple camera movement. I'm not very good at that. But I don't care if there are issues because this is not production. Got some cut out without the wings. I worked a lot on the materials on this one because I really wanted it to resemble the SpaceX Starship. And etc. etc. And this was 24 hours rendering on my secondary computer. And this one show off how all the system works. There are issues. So it explains how it lands. I wanted a mechanical design that looks chunky and Soviet, but 
felt like a mecca. Horrible camera movement. Yeah. And explaining how the storage works. So at this point, I thought, OK, let's learn something new. Let's learn geometry nodes. And I always had the dream of having the possibility of creating and giving to a computer the most boring part of the spaceship production, the detailing. But detailing have to follow very particular rules, so it's not that easy. So let's try. And for understanding what to tell to my computer, I have to understand how design works and why good design works in a certain way. So I asked Alex, a dear friend of mine uh, that used to work in my position before, Noax, you may know him, uh, can I use your picture to explain what good design is? He said yes. So let's take his truck. A lot of people copied it. So that's the demonstration it is successful. It has proportions, right? It has an iconic shape. Very grounded, not very alienish. It, remind, it reminds absolutely of a human design, very militaristic, works well. It has primary shapes, it has secondary shapes, and it has a good distribution of details. Not evenly spread it, spread it on the top, spread it on the rear, there are repetitions, everything works. Alex, from this point of view, is amazing. There is um, echoing of angles. The more you put, the more alien or design the spaceship will look like. The less you put, uh, the more grounded and human and industrial the vehicle will li look like. And then there is framing. A little thing about framing, because it's often forgotten for people that do hard surface art, is that our brain synthesizes things. A four-year child sees a raccoon and says, that's a cat. So we see a barrel and we say, it's a cylinder. But things that are man-made have industrial process that require a lot of elaboration and having a lot of reference is actually not a good thing. It's fundamental. There is no chance to, good, to do good design and good concept design without having good references. This might be everything. But on the left, you had what our mind percept as a barrel or a cannon. And on the right, there is using proportion, echoing, framing. Uh, that's a way of elaborating. It can be whatever. It can be a, a hatch, uh, a syringe for a video game is the one that they plant. Doesn't matter. But things are more complex if they are man-made than what our mind remembers them. I did an example also in my design. There is a lot of framing around the radar. radar. So, I don't think about these kind of things when I do uh, my design, but I've gone back and checked. Do I have primary shapes? Yeah, I do. Secondary shapes? No problem. I put negative shapes, because why not? It helps to break the silhouette. It helps to feel that design is more uh, believable. And then, of course, details. I try to check if there are flows, because I have to tell the computer if there are flows. And there is kind of some variation in the shape. It's not an horizontal line, this shape. And the distribution of details follows those flows. So I started this a month ago. It's not amazing. But it started taking all the stuff I was using for making my blockouts. And you can see some here. I went back in this file, took the main parts that I liked the most, put them together, did exactly what, uh, what Daniel did yesterday, but worse. And, okay. and got all the huge library of uh, Kitbash uh, that I have. Took Simon Tom's file from uh, the Blender Studio. And this was the result. Fine with it, nothing wrong. It can open your mind, but I thought it might be something better. Although I needed help. Thank you. <laughs> Three years ago, I met Lucas. He is much smarter than me, so he helped me a lot with the math. Uh, we met in the Blender conference, by the way. And he helped me a lot uh, 
basically taking my words and understanding what I wanted to do and actually making it work. So I have a quick video of how it progressed uh, and how it worked in the, in the beginning. I can actually accelerate it a bit. there was enough variety, I was quite happy with the shapes that uh, we could obtain. I tried to put some uh, negative shapes as well, like Simon did. Um, had quite fun, give the impression that there was plates. I put details, I used the bounding box to create a negative shape to actually have a bit of framing, so everything doesn't feel like just stuck on a surface, but it wasn't um, it doesn't work perfectly, but it works good enough. Oops. No, what am I doing? Sorry. Then, oh God. <laughs> okay, I don't have to use the arrow. Then when I was trying to do the cables that are a fundamental part of my design, I encountered the first real problems and that's, um, uh, that was a disaster. A little note, I officially stand here using Comic Sans because I want to demonstrate against the high price of Helvetica. <laughs> Thank you. We use the volumetrics to create a rough uh, decimator. Um, I scattered points on the surface and I tried uh, cables. And of course, this is not the result I wanted. So that's um, confusing, not necessary. And that's where uh, Lucas came and helped me a lot. So uh, we started with using the um, hedge pathfinding node. There are many ways to use it. We came out with better solution after. This was our first attempt. I was already very, very happy about it, not gonna lie. I find out that if you triangularize um, the source mesh for scattering the curves on, you actually can have a much more veiny looking um, kind of pipes that might be very useful for making alien ships. I don't know, it's just a note for the future. Changing the seeds, you change the way those cables spawn, but it was still nothing, uh, nothing special at that point. I mean, for me, yes, but let's deconstruct. So we say that we need primary shapes, and I selected those. The most important is the one on the right, because it gives a different flow than just a boring uh, flat, uh, flat shape. Uh, we have secondary shapes that spawn on the selected primary shapes. And we have a first layer of details that also use the bounding box of their volume to create a negative shapes. And some extra uh, gribble for making just surface noise. All selected by the spaceship I already had. And after I scat them everything, we started doing more complex uh, pipes. This is actually uh, Lucas' work. Uh, he had the idea of, to avoid the overlap of pipes on each other, to use the data that we take from the segments that we use as pipes and remove them from the hole and plug the next pipe from that hole with removed areas. So they always stick to each other because you keep removing geometry from the source uh, mesh you scatter the pipes on. We, I then uh, changed a bit of th things. He went visiting me in England, I went to the toilet for number one. You cannot claim I've been in the toilet for 20 minutes. And I came back and there was UV mapping, thank you. <laughs> and these are the section and how each one works. So I say that I put bounding box for creating the negative shapes the best solution it would be to create bespoke meshes. Didn't have the time to do that, I'm sorry. Ah, a bit of 
details how the tree works. This is the way of scatter uh, details on faces. It's incredibly useful if you know design because you can use the positive Z for scattering uh, vents because air, warm air goes up. You can use it for scattering the details in, cer in certain areas depending by the bending of the corners. So we don't put flat things in around curves. We put the engines on the bottom, obviously, or create in particular engines like retro thruster for the, for the front. Wings on the side. And this disaster for the decals, uh, it will be probably one of the first things I will rework on when I will go back uh, working on this project. I want the, um, water tanks or fuel tanks to have a distinction between the top and the bottom of the ship. And of course, some negative shapes to create a sense of uh, plate ring. One thing I mentioned earlier that I would have liked to do uh, bespoke uh, negative booleans for creating framing. I did it for the Vitals engines actually. So we have the positive part and the negative part in the same object with different materials. So I used the separate geometry with a material selection and in this way we can have framing because I did a slightly bigger negative shapes around the engine and every time the engine spawns actually dig around the hull and creates this kind of framing, but can be better even with the engines because if it, they spawn on the front of the ship, it would be quite stupid to have part of the ship that are uh, directly exposed to the trusted fire. So the red uh, that you can see here on the right is the negative part that with the material selection will be used as a negative boolean to remove volumes from behind the engines. Same done for the, this other kind of, um, this other kind of VTOL engine to create space above them for the tanks. And some work on the material. This is six minutes. I am sure you don't want to see this for six minutes. So we'll go a little faster and I will drink. So what happens here is basically the material is divided in uh, four main parts. The base color, the decal color, the edgeware, and the AO. It's quite simple standard, uh, standard workflow. It's not moving. Okay. Uh, it's quite a standard workflow, it's nothing special. Uh, so I'll, we're in the Blender conference, you know how to use Material Shader. The projection of the decals come from above. Yesterday, actually, uh, watching Daniel's talk, I think might be a great idea to have randomly selected uh, decals and randomly selected masks to create variations. I was trying to give this uh, Chris Foss vibe with these big, huge chest decals putting some, um, some platering in different projections, using a mask created, multiplying a noise with Voronoi texture. <laughs> and this was literally me making experiments and not understanding how things were not working, so. <laughs> Still in Comic Sans. Again, what's the power of the Blender community is that I can find any information I need. With a bunch of clicks, or I can. So I did this just to have a mask to avoid the sense of repetitions between two different mapped uh, plate textures. can choose how much, uh, how big they can be, how spread it, how evenly, etc. And then I start making colors. Try to create some variation. Also in the rough map, which 
it's very useful for giving the idea of something painted over and not made of the same material. And that's it, really. So the final result of the condition of the geometry nodes right now is this one, which can be better, but I'm quite satisfied of. I accelerated a bit because every reshuffle of the seeds take around five, six seconds. But the possibility that this can have in the future, I think is quite amazing. So far, the use in the industry would be probably limited to background shapes or something more really useful for, uh, for starting a project and giving your art director, your lead, many different shapes and studying many different things. But this is surely going somewhere. You can also shuffle the, the pipes, uh, changing the seeds of, the, of, of, any, of anything, really. And then it can be used for quick iterations. I, uh, I will accelerate this one as well because otherwise we go over time. This is me making a quick scene, multiply, change the seeds, mm, volumetrics because, because volumetrics are awesome. Set your scene, couple of lights, make a gradient, and have fun. To this kind of scene, I also put a texture in the density, so it looks more uh, less even, and motion blur helps a lot. And the result is decent, with different, um, there was too, many, too much motion blur, sorry about that. And something more calm, but yeah. This is it. So what happened next? I'm gonna have a, a fucking holiday. <laughs> but after, I would like to work on the variety, both of the shader and both of the shapes, and having more controls will actually be better, and eventually creating another system that allowed me to model the main shape without letting it be generated and just taking care of the detail. But that's it. Thank you very much. I'm not sure, am I allowed to ask for questions? Two questions, three questions. Oh. If there are questions. Hi. Hi. Um, so, like, it's all these little details, and you come from product design, right? So, yes. all these little details and or, are very ornamental and very, um, very, uh, how do you say, um, decorative. Mm -hmm. How do you go on, especially like with your background in the more minimalistic shapes, to make sure that like these ornamental details are still like tasteful? Oh, well, there is a huge difference between concept art or concept design and product design. That is, that product design hides, uh, try to let keep something normal like a bottle, and making it sci-fi. While a concept designer will take something not existing like polygons and let try to let them be believable and more consistent with the virtual world. So while in product design I would try to do everything to hide a screw, in the concept design I would actually emphasize it. So that's one of the answer. But if I may give an opinion, I hate minimalism. <laughs> and there was someone behind? Okay. Well then, okay. They don't have to work together. You mean rig animation and geometry nodes? Yeah, because both, as I understand, are to tell uh, the rector or whoever with you what you want to do. This are not the production ready assets. This is yeah. concept design, both of them, right? So 
Well, I would use the geometry nodes more in an initial phase, while rig can be very useful. I've recently done, um, what can I say about that? Done land vehicles for like rigging quickly uh, the suspensions and make short animation on uh, like how distant is the bottom of the car from the ground, stuff like that. Well, this comes more at the moment for the situation it is now as a open your mind moment like when you create um, a slightly more elaborated blockouts. Pardon? Hi. Yes, okay. Hi. Sorry, uh, uh, when you create blender shader for your space ship for um, Star Citizen, do you have to bake the material to get to the runtime next, or is, uh, is there a pipeline you can replace the material with the pipeline? Now, in uh, Star Citizen, for what it is, the props, environments, and hard surface area, we don't bake. We use the um, bent normals, the weighted normals, to create the impression it is baked, but that would request too much VRAM to have baked texture for every items we have because we work in modular, uh, modular things. So we try to keep the bespoke texture to the least we can, especially for organic shapes like bags, um, leather. But if we can use trim sheets, uh, is the best solution to optimize the workflow. You have more draw calls, but you have less texture on your VRAM. Okay. Well, thank you very much.